So this is going to be the overview of all of the different synchronization uh, techniques that we have to implement on the receiver side. Um, and there's three uh, sort of like big issues with our receiver that we'll need to address. Um, so the first one, which we're going to focus on today, is that the way that we demodulate currently by just multiplying by um, like the cosine and sine of the same frequency and phase as the transmitter, uh, we can't actually do that because this demodulation scheme assumes that the uh, assumes that we know the exact carrier frequency, the exact frequency and phase of the trans of, of the carrier at the transmitter of the transmitter. Yes, um, and in reality, it can be off by several kilohertz because if you remember, like one megahertz is quite a quite a big number. So like. I don't know, several kilohertz for yeah, sure, huh? Yeah, some kilohertz. Even with a crystal, we get some small deviation, especially yeah. across like temperature, so. Yeah, um, and the receiver has no way of knowing exactly what the transmitter's carrier frequency and phase are. Um, so, we, so yeah, like, uh, if you remember, like, in module two, we assumed that the received constellation looks basically the same as the transmitted constellation, if not just for, um, excuse me, some added noise. But in fact, if you try to implement this demodulation scheme in real life, um, your received constellation will actually look something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and we call like this sort of spinning effect um, this isn't the technical term, but it's what I call it because it looks like it's spinning. Um, <laughs> the sort of spinning effect is because the uh, frequency and phase of the carrier on the receiver side is different than that of the transmitter side. Um, so we'll be focusing on how to fix that. And this this is called yes, this is called carrier synchronization. Um, so we'll be focusing on how to fix that later in this lecture. Um, but before that, I just want to go over the two other big issues with our receiver that uh, we will address using uh, receiver different synchronization methods. Um, so the second one is that right now our receiver, if you remember in MATLAB, you just do uh, like when you want to pick the samples that correspond to the symbols, you just do one colon SPS colon N. Um, so like. Um, where SPS was 80. Uh, but this assumes that the receiver gets the symbols at the exact same time that the transmitter sends them. And like just from, I don't know, basic physics, uh, we, we know that it takes uh, a non-zero time for, um, for a wave to travel some distance D. Um, yeah, so we're, we're also gonna fix that um, later on in we're gonna fix that in the next module. Um, but then also just to like give a bit more insight into what this issue is, if you have this received waveform on, um, if you have this waveform on the receiver end, like I guess the ideal points to sample at are like, uh, maybe I'll highlight them, uh, or like, this time and then here. Actually, I think I'll draw here, 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 here. Um, and what that will result in on the constellation diagram are points at exactly negative one and one and zero on the quadrature plot. But like, what happens if uh, you? choose samples that are just slightly offset. You see how this is, <laughs> this does not bode well for us. So um, instead of being zero, that first, um, this first symbol will correspond to like, or instead of being, oh, did I say, ne did I say negative? Okay, I meant to say, okay, instead of being neg negative one, it'll be like negative 0.8 and then the second symbol will also be like, oh no, it's actually close to zero. 
Oh god, so we might have something that looks like this. Um, because you see all of these points are close to... Y'all know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, we will fix this in the next lecture. But then the third big issue with our receiver, I don't know how to phrase this, we just accept whatever symbols come at us, but this is actually kind of useless, right? Because like if you want to transmit a letter, for example, ASCII characters, each ASCII character has eight bits, um, but like, and like you have to know that the eight bits are together so that they form a particular letter. Um, so the way that we'll fix that is by um, what, what's called packet headers and data packets, which are like structured sections of bits that are, um, and our receiver will know how to identify what is the start of a certain data packet. Um, but yeah, so like if you have the letter S, for example, so like say we've demodulated properly and everything, um, and on the receiver end we have this uh, stream of zeros and ones, the thing is like, you don't actually, the receiver doesn't actually know that we want all of these, you know, we want to consider all of these bits together as an S. Like, what if the receiver forgot, or what if the receiver missed this first bit and then just started, um, started, I guess, receiving these bits, and that's a zero, so you, you get an entirely different letter. Um, so, yeah, we will get into that later, but... Yeah, these are the big the big issues. Um, the first one, so in the in the literature, <laughs> um, uh, typically you see carrier synchronization. Actually, no, I think yeah, carrier synchronization is the is the like main word for that. But oftentimes you'll see symbol synchronization. Um, also called timing or clock recovery. I won't be using this term because I think it's super vague because like all of these things are timing and clock recovery in their own way. But um, yeah, just know that there's that discrepancy. But yeah, so we um, will need to implement um, carrier synchronization, symbol synchronization, and frame synchronization. And today we will be talking about um, carrier synchronization. So I did have another icebreaker, but I feel like we're going through this pretty fast, so I think it'll be okay. Actually, no, is that your, share one thing that you're you're looking forward to. In 2024. Uh, 2024, hardware. Hardware's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and working hardware is even better. So, stay Yay! Tuned. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay, cool. <laughs> Good icebreaker. Okay, and you get it, because it's like, it's Ice an icebreaker, breaker. but you're taking a break. Wow. Yeah. Uh, slap. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I'm trying so hard. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Getting more into carrier synchronization. So, um, in order to like understand how we're gonna do carrier synchronization, actually, do we understand what carrier synchronization is? Like, the receiver needs to know the phase and frequency of the um, transmitter's carrier so that it can match the phase and frequency of the transmitter's carrier. Um, but, uh, uh, so like to understand this, first I want to talk about the relationship between frequency and phase. Um, have y'all like seen this, that frequency is the derivative of the phase, or phase is the integral of frequency? It's kind of intuitive, right? Like, if you think about a circle and like, um, let's say you have some phase <coughs> represented with this vector, um, and your frequency is just like how fast this, uh, this phase is changing over time. Um, I think that's all I needed to say there. Did you say that the phase is the integral of frequency? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I also have that here. Um, this seems like kind of a random fact, but it'll be useful in a few slides. 
Um, and then just as a check for your understanding, I have these two questions. Um, so first, if you have two oscillators and they're at the same exact same frequency, but the oscillator oscillator one has phase phi one and oscillator two has phase phi two, will their phase difference change with time? No. Can you explain why? Because they move at the same rate. Yeah. And then number two, if you have two oscillators of frequencies that you don't know, um, but those two oscillators have the same phase difference over time, what is their frequency difference? Zero. Yeah. And why is that? They have to be in phase, or they have to have the same frequencies each other, because otherwise the, the phase would change, phase would change. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we got it. I have this like. Actually, I'm going to show you my little animation of the box because I think it's cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can think of setting clocks. Like these have a phase offset, but the frequency is the same. But these have a frequency offset. Yeah, that's all that was. Anyway. <laughs> did, you, did you just find two different clock animations? Yes, but also to get the frequency, to get the phase offset one, I deleted the first few stills of that gif. <laughs> so like, I'm very, nice. this is very advanced. You know? um, did you put it with the other one? Yes. <laughs> Amazing. I did a circular shift. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, and then we just talked about how we assume that the receiver is perfectly in sync with the transmitter, but we actually see this spinning effect. Um, and to see this spinning effect um, in the time domain, um, uh, so like, yes, to see this, so like uh, in the constellation, you have, I guess the big difference between this like spinning received constellation and this you know, ideal constellation is that you have um, you have a non-zero quadrature component, um, and when you look at the time domain data, um, you see that so like before the frequency offset, we have this ideal wave where if you plot the i and q, the i is you know changing, um, like the phase of it is changing, and the q component is zero. But after you add a frequency offset. Um, the Q component also goes like kind of crazy and you see that reflected in the constellation diagram um, and I, I won't go much more into why exactly the actually maybe I will yeah okay okay and then a, a sneak peek of your module number four um, if you have a phase offset, say you have a constant like 45 degree phase offset at the receiver, um, then what your constellation diagram will look like is uh, like a cloud of points here and a cloud of points here. and this is where the relationship between fre frequency and phase comes in. Because what if you have a constant, it doesn't matter, a constant like 10 hertz frequency offset at the receiver. Um, this frequency offset basically means that the phase offset is constantly changing. So that's why we get this spinning effect in the constellation. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, so um, you so frequency is the derivative of phase, right? Um, so if you have a constant 45 degree phase offset, then like this cloud of points will just kind of move like that and it'll be like that throughout the duration of the signal. Um, but if you have a frequency offset, not a phase offset, then ha like having a frequency offset is like having 
a phase offset that changes over time. Um, because, like, the, like, at one point you'll have a 45 degree phase offset, but then, like, that phase offset will continue to change as the, as your signal Because frequency is, like, the rate at which the phase is changing. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that I mean, it's yeah. a derivative again, and I got it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, and I make y'all do some math derivations in module four, so y'all will y'all will get this. And I'm gonna make sure of that. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, basically, this whole issue of carrier sync is that we need algorithms to sync up the receiver and transmitter carrier. Um, so, like, uh, for example, we need one way to, uh, I guess, yeah, we need a way to, um, I guess, like, identify what the frequency of the transmitter actually is. And once we know what the frequency of the transmitter is, we can set that, we can have the frequency of the receiver's carrier match the frequency of the transmitter's carrier. And so that will allow us to, instead of having all of these instead of having this spinning, just have a cloud of points at whatever the phase offset is. And then we can do this additional stage where um, we figure out what this phase is so that we can get our, our, our clouds back to where we want them to be. Um, so just to not confuse y'all, I will say at first that we'll be using this fancy algorithm that can do both of these steps at once. So, very hype. What's up, Alex? Uh, frequency estimation correction, is, do we just, can, can we, is this something that we just can force, can we brute force, and just find something that eventually makes a pretty shape of constellations and we just go with that, or? Yeah, so you could do that. Um, the thing is, like, computation time on the MCUs is very limited. Um, but my next slide is actually kind of related to your question. Because, um, like, for this frequency estimation stage, at least, like, as electrical engineers, there is one tool that we throw at everything that comes our way. And what, what is that? FFT. Yeah, FFT. Um, so, <laughs> why don't we just throw an FFT at it, Grace? Well, let me tell you, and I want to say things correctly, so I have written things down. Um, so, yeah, we, we could just do an FFT on the transmitter's carrier to determine its frequency, and then we could, we could get from this first constellation diagram to the second one. Um, pros are, it does, FFT does produce an accurate frequency. Um, and it is, uh, I'll, I'll write this down first, valid regardless of the speed of <clears throat> the receiver or transmitter um, and by this I mean if the receiver like if the receiver board is like physically moving or if the transmitter board is physically moving because um, you know like Doppler shift is a thing um, because if two wave sources are moving with respect to each other then the, the frequency of the wave changes um, and then the other pro to just doing an FFT is that uh, after doing an FFT, we can demodulate <coughs> as usual. As in, once we find that correct frequency, um, I mean, we will have this phase offset, but like, yeah, but, but like from here to here, you can't just brute force to figure out what that phase offset is, and, and then and then you're, you're chilling. Um, 
However, there's some cons to doing this FFT. One, uh, and this is the main one, is that it's computationally expensive. Anyone know the computational complexity of an FFT? It's logarithmic, right? And log n. Yeah, oh, it's n log n, because it's like divide and conquer. I learned so much from 180, Mario. <laughs> <laughs> no revise. <laughs> um, and also, after doing the FFT, you still have to demodulate, because like, doing the FFT just tells you what that carrier frequency is. Once you know that carrier frequency, then you have to do that multiplied by the carrier frequency low-pass filter, and then you have to do the phase correction, or the phase estimation and correction. Um, so like, I'll say like, and have to actually <coughs> demodulate. Um, and then also the um, FFT thing, like the FFT approach, like doing an FFT, it gives you a frequency, but there's no time dependence. Um, so if the frequency is changing, you'd have to like keep doing the FFT over again. Um, so I'll say, uh, fails. The frequency is changing. <coughs> the frequency is changing, mm -hmm. but doesn't that also include Doppler shift, because is a Doppler shift a frequency change, depending on, like, the, is it, isn't it frequency Yeah, change? so, or I guess I explained this badly, like, it, like, it works if you redo it, and the, it oh, so works like if you every, so basically every it. tick, or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Use some example period. Okay. So So you could theoretically, yeah, do an FFT if both were stationary, because you could. Because then it's like, oh, you only have to do it once, and after that you can keep demodulating in real time. But um, there's a there's a cool algorithm that we'll use that um, basically bypasses the need to use an FFT and does the demodulation step in the same like in the same algorithm. But yeah. Cool. Oh my gosh, Grace, what are we going to do? We can't do an FFT. <laughs> don't worry. No, we're going to talk about something that I don't know that much about, but it's okay. <laughs> so, um, PLLs, um, I have just the, the Wikipedia definition. The PLL is an automatic control system that adjusts the phase of a local signal to match the phase of the input reference signal. Uh, for our purposes, um, like if you're the PLL is this, uh, I guess algorithm that if you give it a, um, if you give it this like the reference, yes, the reference is blue, and then it generates the the red one is the thing that is the signal that it generates, and you can see that over time, um, this PLL is able to match, is, is able to generate a signal that matches the phase of the blue reference signal. Um, and it's used a lot in RF systems. Um, it's, it, the reason we mentioned Zaire is because it's, uh, you can't implement it with hardware. Um, we will be implementing it in software. But um, yeah, and then there's three main components of a PLL. 
the first is a phase detector, because first you need to know um, the relative phase between a local your local signal and the input reference signal. Um, and then next you have a numerically controlled oscillator. In hardware, this is typically a voltage controlled oscillator. Um, and this is just something that, this is just a, yeah, like an oscillator that, whose frequency is dependent on a certain number, or in the case of a voltage controlled oscillator, uh, a certain voltage. Um, and then there's also a loop filter, which is basically your control scheme for like, oh, if you know that your uh, phase is off by this amount, um, what is the new phase that we're going to try? Do you have anything you want to add, Sayer? I feel like you know more about these than I do. Yeah, I mean, PLLs are used like, all over the place. Yeah. Um, as far as hardware stuff goes, we'll talk about it like, a bit more later, but um, right now, best ways is to implement it in software. So. If you want to learn more about PLLs, uh, talk to me later. Go into the details a bit more. Yeah. Um, oh, I was going to... Just Does the PLL assume they have the same frequency? No, it doesn't. Yeah, so it's like resistant, or it's robust to differences in frequency as well as phase, which is awesome. Um, just want to check. So the, does the generator frequency like slow down as it progressively goes and like when it matches it matches okay. so the generated frequency can either be like have a higher or lower frequency than the than the reference signals frequency and the algorithm if if all goes well will be able to lock onto so the it, correct it eventually matches like we know that the generated frequency is the target that we want so, uh, basically. That's the goal of it, okay. yeah. Um, so it's like a PID controller? Pretty much is. It's just mm -hmm. feedback. We're and then eventually we'll get to that. Um, and then I was also going to write things down so that it's not just my words going into the ether. But um, phase detector, you can think of it as this block diagram that takes the reference signal and the signal of the NCO, or the numerically controlled oscillator, this is our local signal, and then it produces um, some outputs that is proportional to the phase difference between this reference signal and the NCO. So like the red and blue, blue signals in this photo. Um, and then the, I will say, the for the numerically controlled oscillator, since we're implementing it in software, it's like not, <laughs> not like a, there isn't like a, a big, uh, there isn't like a super strong um, physical interpretation of it, but you can think of it um, similarly to the voltage controlled oscillator, which is an oscillator whose frequency, or whose, vol yes, whose frequency depends on voltage. Like really, it can look like anything. The only requirement is that um, the voltage versus frequency curve is monotonically increasing. So the higher the voltage, the higher the, fre the, out the frequency of the oscillation. Um, yeah, and then, uh, like you mentioned, Kevin, the loop filter is our like control scheme, control thing. Uh, I'll just say PID. Uh, but in this case, we, we don't use a D term, so it's just a PI controller. But anyway, um, I also want to include a block diagram about how these three main components fit together. And that is this. Um, so, yeah, does this kind of make sense? So, like, you have your reference signal. 
Um, and then you have, I don't know if it's exclamation marks. So you have your, so your phase detector like wants to know, I guess, like how much error you have. So like wants to compare the phase of the reference signal versus the VCO or NCO. Um, and then based on that error, so like, and then you give that error, to the loop filter and then the loop filter tells the VCO or NCO um, what the new phase estimate is and I'll say there is theta minus theta hat. Um, so the reference signal is what we're picking up at the receiver. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. That makes sense. And then yeah so Cool. Can we just implement a PLL in software um, to solve all of our problems? Um, and the answer is not exactly, because um, like I guess as um, as Cameron was mentioning, it's like a little bit tricky to um, to know the phase of the to be able to lock onto the phase of the received signal. Um, the tricky part of the PLL for our purposes is the space detector part because if you remember the modulation scheme that we're using is BPSK. <laughs> so <laughs> if the constant loop is trying to find the phase of our signal and every time we switch from a 0 to a 1 or a 1 to a 0 you have this sudden phase jump, the PLL like isn't going to help us because it's not able to to lock onto the phase um, properly, and then also like just to clarify, or just to uh, yeah clarify I guess um, the way that we're using the PLL to match the frequency is that we're using the PLL to match the phase, and if you if you're if two and we just went over like if two phases if the phases of two different singles match, then the frequencies will also match. Um, but yeah, so BBSK has this phase switching, so we can't quite just like slap a, a typical phase detector on it. Um, so what this brings us to is a solution called the Costas loop. Costas is someone's last name. Um, and it's based on a PLL, um, excuse me, but, excuse me, um, the, uh, but the, well no, it, it basically, no, it is a PLL, but um, the phase detector is implemented in a collateral way. So um, here I have on the top right is just our vanilla PLL block diagram. Um, and the topology of the costless loop is shown below. Um, so basically, like if you just look at it visually, you can see the same um, components of like loop filter feeding into the VCO, loop filter feeding into the VCO. Um, but the interesting thing about the Casas loop is how this phase detector is implemented. Um, and if you notice, so like phase detector is the input to the loop filter specifically. Um, but um, so I'm not gonna get too much into the details of um, <coughs> Of the cost of sleep, there's some excellent. Whoa, it looks so highlighted. There's some excellent um, uh, other tutorials that I will link to. But um, basically, like the idea of the cost of sleep is that um, the bless you, bless you. The if okay, so consider. Uh, the, the, um, consider the transmitted signal, like, at the 
as the input to the Casas loop. So we'll say um, u of t is a of t times uh, cosine of the carrier frequency plus some phase offset. Um, and a of t is just either negative one, no, this one. It's either negative one or positive one with our VPSK. Well, this is actually not. Or a of t is um, a sequence of rectangular pulses. either positive one or negative one um, and then you know this is our modulation so what we're gonna do is multiply our incoming signal by um, two times cosine I'll explain what this is <coughs> in a second So theta is, we'll call, uh, theta is the phase of the input signal, and then theta hat is, as you can guess, um, the Costas loop, estimate So, yeah, okay, I think I'll keep explaining from here. So, it turns out that if you multiply your um, incoming signal with, the, with a cosine times of like approximately the same frequency um, and with your Okay, wait, it turns out if you um, do some fun trig identities, the product of these two signals, um, and then you apply the low-pass filter, will be some constant times A of T times cosine of theta minus theta hat. Um, and this bodes well for us because we want something that we want to create a phase detector which knows the difference between theta and theta hat. Um, and then similarly on the bottom branch of the Costas loop, we have <coughs> um, the incoming signal times we have this times the negative or times the sine at the same frequency and the, the cost of sleep estimate of theta. Um, for now, you can don't worry about the two the two times cosine or the negative two times sine. That's just a normalization thing. Um, <clears throat> so similarly, uh, at the bottom branch of the cost of sleep, you'll get something um, alpha times a of t sine of theta minus theta hat, and at this point, the top branch and the bottom branch get multiplied together. Um, and if you do some more trig identities, um, what you'll get is, um, of course, the, well, if you're just multiplying alpha AT times alpha AT, you'll just get alpha squared AT squared. Um, and then the trig identities bit will give you, or er, of multiplying the cosine and the sine will give you one half um, sine of two times theta minus theta hat. So the gamma constants term we don't really care about. We can fix with normalization factors and stuff. 
Um, a squared of t, we know that that will always be 1 because a of t at any point in time will always be plus 1 or minus 1. So if you take the square, it will always be 1. Um, so then what we get is um, the loop filter is proportional um, or at the output of the loop filter, we'll get something that's proportional to sine of 2 times theta minus theta hat. Um, cool. And then um, I guess why does this bode well for us? Well, if you think about um, a sine function, the If you have a larger, um, I guess like for the first part of the sine function, um, if you have a larger input, then you have a larger output. Um, and you can imagine if theta equals theta hat, then you have sine of zero, and sine of zero is zero, meaning zero phase error. Um, so when the VCO, or sorry, Yes, so then when the, so then, okay, so this input stuff is essentially your error signal for the loop filter, and then your loop filter is going to be your PI controller, um, and then, uh, yeah, so like if you have, if theta minus theta hat is High, then you'll have a higher error, and then <clears throat> your PI controller will be able to more aggressively um, change the. Uh, your loop filter will give you a new data hat to try, um, and then the cycle continues throughout your your signal. Um, and then the other cool thing about the Casas loop is if you look at the top branch of the um, Casas loop, um, you'll notice that in the case where theta equals theta hat, what you have is cosine of zero, and cosine of zero is one. So you're able to actually um, recover this A of T that we wanted. And so the top branch of the Casas loop actually gives you your demodulated signal. Pretty cool. Casas loop gives you uh, the Casas loop does both the phase slash frequency tracking and it does the demodulation. How does it do demodulation if it squares the negative one? Because it's, it's the demodulated is before it's multiplied by. Oh, the okay, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Cool. Cool, huh? That's really cool. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, from an IQ perspective, okay, and then I have an image of this on the assignment, but I, um, I think I, okay, I will say that for the assignment, but okay. Um, and then if you look at the I and Q signals in time, um, what you'll see is that applying the Costas loop, um, you're able to like, the cost loop is able to get rid of, is able to adjust the free phase and frequency such that um, your Q component is zero. And what you, so like, I guess like what you'll see, if you were to, I think I am going to save this for the animation so I don't confuse people. <laughs> um, that is the next slide. Yes, okay. Okay, now I have this really uh, nice animation of Casas loop in action that I will show. So if you notice, wait, did we miss it already? Hold on. Okay, yeah, so at the beginning, 
when your fastest loop is trying to lock onto the right phase, you see like kind of the effect of the PI controller, like some initial large oscillations, but eventually as more signals, like as time goes on, um, your constellation diagram is able to find the correct phase and your constellation diagram ends up looking like the, the ideal that we want. Does that make sense? So like this also explains the spinning effect because um, like, actually, I, I think I think that. Does this make sense? Yes. <laughs> I feel like if I talk too much, it's not good. What's up? Uh, so during the animation, there are some points that are earlier in the, <coughs> in the iterations that seems to resemble a ideal solution where like the dots converge. Yeah. Uh, like uh -huh. is it is it just better to like repeat the iterations like even after reaching that point to like get a more correct solution or? Yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not that sure. Um, I think. I don't know. Sometimes it just depends on what your symbols happen to be. Um, but yeah, you, you typically do just like want to let the um, or like okay, because like what's happening is that like with a PI controller, you'll I guess with a P overshoot. controller specifically, you'll overshoot. overshoot. Yeah. So it's not necessarily that we should do more iterations for more uh, for a correct like answer. It's just that like because it's a PI controller, we go it takes some it. time for it to settle. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is the top plot. The top the plot. Error? Yeah, it's hard to it's hard to see, but is it the error of the phase error? Because you this is a MATLAB. I mean, you have the original signal anyways. So is the top one just the error? Yeah, so the top one, um, it's very small there, but it says the frequency offset in hertz. Um, so you can think of it as the, the phase error. Um, it's a little bit like, it's a little bit weird because the frequency offset settles to <laughs> like 500 hertz. Uh, but I think what that's showing is the, um, is that the Costas loop is able to identify the, what the frequency offset is, and once you, um, but like, you, you don't actually have to know the frequency offset because you just kind of the Costas loop fixes it. But you'll you'll implement this in the module and you'll see what I mean. Okay, adding on to what you said, Alex, there's like a metric called EVM that just determines okay whatever you know bit you're trying to intercept, whatever symbol, how far away your dots are from that, and it's like a measurement of your error pretty much. Okay. Usually it's, it's like a given value for like communication system what you should be at before like considering it like, okay, read this value. Okay. Yeah. Um, so almost to the end, um, there's another small issue with our receiver, which isn't a synchronization issue, so I didn't include it in the three big synchronization issues, um, but just a small issue which you'll need to address in module four. Um, and it's that you use this fan you use this magic function called low pass for demodulation, um, and it, the issue with this function is that even though it's convenient for us to use, it doesn't exist in C because like it does a lot of complex math, um, and it, it and I'll have you do this in the module. But if you look at the actual um, filter coefficients of the filter that it gives you, it has like 50 or so filter coefficients, which for our um, limited compute power MCU is way too many. Um, so what you'll need to do is design your own um, filter to get rid of that, the double frequency component. Um, and like one of the first questions that comes to mind when you're designing filters is should I use an FIR filter, a finite impulse response, or an IRR filter, an infinite impulse response. Um, I'm not gonna go that into this for sake of time, but short answer is we're gonna use a finite impulse response, um, and you'll be implementing this in the module as well. Um, but yeah, module four, we'll be implementing the Costas loop. Um, we'll be hopefully getting a, a much stronger intuition on um, using constellation diagrams to see what's going on in your communication system. Um, I'll release it so that you can work on it throughout this week and then it'll be due next Thursday um, and hopefully 
after that, everyone will have all the basics for both hardware and software, and will be able to um, start specializing. Zayer, did you have any other announcements? That's pretty much it. Okay. Um, if you've not done module three, or you have some, just let me know. Um, if you're working on it, great. Um, just you know, if you're not started, let me know. We can figure out a time to just edit the parts. Sounds good. Um, yeah. Other than that, I have these. these oh, I have to hold it. I have these other resources. I'll um, also post the slides tonight, and y'all can peruse as needed. Um, I have a feeling I went a little fast here, but um, hopefully, I guess my goal was to just get y'all excited about this. So hopefully. Um, if you're interested, you do kind of take the time to um, like process these concepts in your head. It definitely took me a long time to um, really understand what, really understand all the concepts that are coming together to get this thing to work. Um, so yeah, that is all. Are your libraries supported? It's on the website. I don't know off the top of my head. I think Anything we have, like, else? Fridays, we're like from 1 to 2 p.m. I think we have the same. Could be wrong. That's okay. all I know. Also, I might. Only there were a reference, right? Like hmm? a page you could go to. I know. Yeah. I know. Cool. Um, yeah. And then if you want more grapes or candy, they're here for you. Apologies about the pizza.